turn to the book of the Acts. And we'll turn first of all to Acts and chapter 6. Acts chapter 6, I'm commencing to read at verse number 1. I just need to move around a little bit with our reading this evening, so bear with me. Acts 6, verse 1, and in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews, because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of disciples unto them and said, It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, whom we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And the saying pleased the whole multitude. And they chose Stephen, a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost, and Philip, Prochorus, Nicanor, and Timon, and Parmen Parmenas, and Nicholas, a proselyte of Antioch, whom they set before the apostles. And when they had prayed, they laid their hands on them. And the word of God increased. And the number of the disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. Then there arose certain of the synagogue, which is called the synagogue of the Libertines. Now that Libertine is, uh, has sort of negative uh, moral connotations for us. Uh, we would think of a libertine as someone who engaged in licentious living. Really, it's just the idea of, of freedmen. So in the Roman Empire, there were uh, slaves who had uh, become free and they were known as freedmen. And so it seems that quite a number of former slaves were gathered in this synagogue, the synagogue of the Libertines and Cyrenians and Alexandrians and them of Cilicia and of Asia disputing with Stephen. And they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spake. Then they suborned men, which said, We have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and against God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes and came upon him and caught him and brought him to the council and set up false witnesses, which said, This man ceaseth not to speak blasphemous words against this holy place and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth shall destroy this place and shall change the customs which Moses delivered us, and all that sat in the council, looking steadfastly on him, saw his face as it had been the face of an angel. And then in chapter 7, uh, we have Stephen's great defense. We're not going to look at that this evening. We'll maybe look at that tomorrow night in the will of the Lord. But just come over with me, please, uh, into chapter number 8. Chapter number 8, just at the beginning of the chapter, we're told that devout men carried Stephen to his burial. And Paul, as for Paul, verse 3, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hailing men and women, committed them to prison. Therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord yet heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies, and that were lame were healed. And there was great joy in that city. But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery, and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one, to whom they all give heed, from the least to the greatest, saying, This man is the great power of God. And to him they had regard because that of long time he had bewitched them of sorceries. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God, the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Then Simon himself believed also, and when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now when the apostles, which were at Jerusalem, heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who, when they were come down, prayed for them, that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. And when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. 
But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God might may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the goal of bitterness and the bond of iniquity. Then answered Simon and said, Pray ye to the Lord for me, that none of those things which ye have spoken come upon me. And then over uh, in the, the end of chapter 8, we have, of course, the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch, that passage that we're very familiar with. And into chapter 9, the very important, the pivotal, really, story of the conversion of the Apostle Paul. But just look down with me to chapter 9 and uh, verse 31. So this is uh, in the aftermath of, of the conversion of Paul, and he has... He has been recognized as a believer by the church of Jerusalem. Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. And we know that God will bless to us the reading of his precious word. It's a uh, fairly extensive and slightly scattered reading, but I hope we'll be able to learn some helpful lessons from it. Now, one of the things that uh, that's very striking about the book of the Acts, and it becomes more striking, I think, the, the more you read uh, through the book of the Acts, is the care and the precision with which Luke, uh, as he writes this history of the early church, has constructed the book. And uh, that can be seen in the book in quite a number of ways. But one feature of the book that I want to draw your attention to this evening can be seen when we look, first of all, at chapter 6 and uh, the verse that we read there at uh, verse number 7. The word of the Lord increased, and the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly, and a great company of priests were obedient to the faith. And then we read over in chapter 9, and just as we said, just after the conversion of the Apostle Paul, we read in verse 31, then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. And one of the features of the book of the Acts is that on six different occasions, as we make our way through the book, we're not going to read them all this evening, but on six occasions, Luke will do just what he does in these verses. He gives us a kind of a summary. Luke is not recording every event that happened. Uh, it would have been impossible for him to do that. He is selecting carefully important narratives and important occurrences. Some he will mention in a great deal of detail. Some he will mention in a, a more summary fashion. And then he will, he will bring that section of his narrative to a close with a verse of summary just to tell us uh, to give us a summary of how things were progressing. And he will do that on, on six occasions through the book. And those six occasions, the first of them here in chapter 6, at the last, at the end of the book in chapter 28, those six occasions divide the book of the Acts into six sections, or some, some have referred to them as, as six panels. And uh, each of those sections, now just to give a very rough figure about it, that's a kind of an average figure, covers about a period of, of five years. Now, in the two previous years that we were looking at the opening chapters of the book of the Acts, we have, of course, been taken up with the first of the panels in the book. And uh, it's not very difficult to see what is really the preoccupation, what is really being presented to us in the first panel. In that first section of the book of the Acts, we are dealing with the immediate aftermath of, of the crucifixion of the Lord Jesus Christ and of his resurrection from the dead. We're seeing how the work gets started. We're learning about the, the day of Pentecost. We're thinking about the power of God through the person of the Holy Spirit at work among the apostles. And uh, we, we have those great discourses, those great messages that, that Peter preaches. And uh, we're just seeing the thing getting established. In that first panel, the focus is still very largely on the city of Jerusalem, 
And as we thought last year, the focus there as we come to the end of the section, it actually tightens beyond just the city of Jerusalem, but it, it tightens really to the, the temple in Jerusalem. And that is going to uh, be something that will be a feature just of Stephen's uh, discourse, particularly as we move into the second panel, because Stephen, of course, the, the, the great objection, or one of the objections that his accusers had to him was this, that he was speaking blasphemies against the temple. And uh, when we get tomorrow night, Lord willing, to, to Stephen's tremendous defense, we're going to see that the temple and the status of the temple and what I might call that the, the specialness of the temple are going to be really central to what Stephen has to say in his great defense. But what is going to be the theme of this, this second half? Well, I think we can, we can get a feel for what is the important theme in the second panel. When we see how it begins and how it ends. I've made a reference already to Stephen's defense in chapter 7. And you will remember that, that, that we don't want to get ahead of ourselves, but that defense is a, a tremendous survey of the history of the nation of Israel. But it begins with this point that the God of glory appeared to Abraham. And Stephen is beginning to tell the story of how God appeared to Abraham with the purpose that he might call him out of Ur of the Chaldees, that he might call him out of the nations. And actually right the way through that defense that Stephen gives, that's what God is doing again and again. He is bringing his people out. Gathering them together, bringing them into the land, bringing them to the place that he had promised, bringing them to where the temple is. But you'll remember that at the end of the section, there's a man called Saul of Tarsus. He's on the way to Damascus with hatred in his heart and with letters in his pocket, giving him permission to persecute the Christians. And as he makes his way and uh, we might say, you'll, you'll pardon the expression, hell bent on persecution. A light above the brightness of the noonday sun shines down upon him. And he hears the voice say, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And something absolutely transformational in the history of Christianity is happening. You see, God has, has called Abraham out. And he's brought his people out. And they've been separated out from the nations of the world. But now God in his glory is appearing to another man. Not to call him out of the nations. But to send him forth to the nations. And we have at the end of this section. The call of the great apostle to the Gentile. And uh, he's to be a witness to kings. He will, before his career comes to an end, he will fulfill the words of prophecy spoken about him. He will stand before Nero himself. He says to uh, Timothy in the second epistle, by me all the Gentiles heard. And, uh, and by the time we get to the end of this panel, we're going to be seeing God laying the foundation for the worldwide spread of the gospel. And in the chapters in between, we're beginning to see a moving out. And we'll see the gospel and it will make its way to Samaria. Well, that was, that was the command, wasn't it? Judea and Samaria and the uttermost parts of the earth. And we'll discover this, that while Philip is preaching in Samaria, seeing great blessing. He's told to leave. And he's told to leave because God has an appointment for him to keep. And the appointment that he's keeping is, is with an Ethiopian. And what we're beginning to see is this. In this section, we're beginning to see the ripples of the gospel as they move wider and wider and wider. You see, it was never, it was never God's intention. It was never God's intention that Christianity would just be a an improved form of Judaism. 
never God's intention that Christianity would be geographically limited. His intention was that this message would go out to all the world. That you'll remember that when he called Abraham, the program that he began, it had in view the blessing of all nations. And there was the necessity to select Abraham, the necessity for God to work with that particular nation. But it was never, that was never where his program, his purpose or his plan ended. No, his plan was to bless all nations. And we're beginning to see in a wonderful way as we move through chapter 6 and 7 and 8, we're beginning to see how that expansion is happening. Until Paul is sent forth as the apostle to the Gentiles, until Peter is sent to Cornelius, Christianity goes global. And it spreads and it spreads and it spreads. And it never has stopped spreading. Thank God wherever we go in this world, the message of the gospel is still relevant. Wherever we go in this world, Christianity is, is still at home. And we're learning just about a, a message and a mission and a work spreading out from Jerusalem and extending to Judea and to Samaria. Thank God to the uttermost parts of the earth. But although we begin, as I've said, a new section really at the uh, at that middle point of chapter 6, just after, just before the, the, the confrontation between Stephen and his accusers, I think it's important that we see that there are continuities from the beginning of chapter 6, but actually from the sections that have gone before as well, that run through the section. And you will note very obviously, very obviously, one of the connections, one of the consistencies with what we were thinking about last year is this, that there's opposition. And uh, you'll remember that in chapter 5, the, the apostles are imprisoned and they're commanded not to speak in this name. And Peter says we were to obey God rather than men. And uh, uh, Gamaliel, he says, well, if this, this thing is of God, we can't resist it. Uh, and if it's not of God, it's just going to, it's just going to, to sputter out. And uh, at the end of chapter 5, they're um, going from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. That then is followed by this important section at the beginning of chapter 6. And... Uh, as we get to the end of that chapter, that, that second in chapter six, as we said already in the summary that we have there at the end of, of the section, we have a time of great blessing. The word of God increased. The number of disciples multiplied. A great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. God is working in a, in a mighty and in a tremendous way. And it's no surprise to us, is it, that immediately, immediately persecution arises. And, uh, and that persecution is not just a repeat of what's gone before. This persecution now has been ratcheted up. And no longer are, have we got a Gamaliel to stand up and to advise restraint and to say, just be careful what you do as touching these men. Now you have, you have men who are so filled with opposition to the message of the gospel, who are so enraged by the clarity of the message that Stephen brings, that they're gnashing at him with their teeth. And uh, ultimately, they are picking up stones and they are, are stoning him. And at the end of chapter 7, a very solemn milestone in the growth and development of Christianity is this. We see the first Christian martyr. And Stephen lies crushed beneath a pile of stone. And devout men carry him out to his burial. And so we do see uh, opposition. But it is, uh, it is a tremendous thing that uh, 
The opposition doesn't have the result that is intended. You see, in chapter 8 and verse 4, we read these words. They that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. Now that word scattered is, is an interesting word. We sometimes hear about the, the, the diaspora or the diaspora, if you, if, you, uh, if you want to be a little bit more pretentious in, in your pronunciation. Now, that's the spora part of that, is the word from which we get our word spore. And uh, really that, 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 that spore word, which is the verb that's used here, has the idea of, of sowing seed. And that's really what was happening. As the persecution in Jerusalem intensified, as uh, following the death of Stephen, as Saul, to use the language of, of verse 3, as Saul makes havoc of the church, and as he persecutes the church, God's people are scattered. But they're scattered not in a, really in a random way. They're spread like seed. And everywhere they go, they go preaching the word. And so we discover that there is a pattern of persecution. But where there is, there's blessing. And the blessing elicits persecution, opposition and persecution. But God will use that opposition. And God will use that persecution so that the work goes on. And that the message spreads the more widely. And while I'm, while I'm at that, one of the great reasons that that happened, you see, it didn't just happen automatically. It wasn't just that the Christians were scattered. In and of itself, that would have achieved very little. But why, why was this scattering so important as far as the spreading of the gospel and the expansion of the work of God was concerned? Well, it's simply this, that they went everywhere. Preaching the word. And as they found themselves in new areas, new cities, new towns, new parts of the world, living among different people, really having to make a life for themselves. And they were refugees, effectively. Having to make a life for themselves in circumstances that were very difficult and very trying. These scattered saints, <laughs> they weren't cowed by persecution. They carried on the preaching of the word of God. You know, that still goes on. We hear sometimes of, of dear saints in, in part of the world where there's persecution like this. Persecution that we would honestly have to say we can't even begin to understand. And uh, we wonder how they keep at it. We could well understand the temptation to... To just keep quiet. With a lot less at stake, that's often what we do. But here are people. <coughs> and they were scattered. No, not scattered. They were planted. They were dispersed. God knew where they were going. God put them there. And where they were, they spoke the word. They preached the word. And they brought the message of the gospel. And so we find, as has happened so often throughout the history of Christianity, that persecution, it produces fruit and the gospel spreads. And it's being spread here. I, I, I want us to notice this. It's being spread here just by, by ordinary Christians. Not, not, it's not now the apostles. Let's say a little bit about them. It's not now even these men that we are going to think about in chapter 6. But it's being spread just by the, the ordinary believers. And that is another continuity between uh, the, the start of chapter 6 and what is developed in this panel in this section of the epistle. You'll remember that back in chapter 6, we have the appointment of these men to, to wait at tables. And uh, we have the... Uh, we have the list of, of the people, the seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, who are appointed by uh, the, appointed by the assembly. 
You'll notice that. Was they were selected by the assembly in Jerusalem. They were uh, set before the apostles. The apostles prayed and laid their hands on them. And they were given a specific responsibility in relation to waiting at tables and to, to managing the work. Uh, that we'll, we'll say a little bit about that in a minute. But isn't it interesting? But as we move over just a couple of, of pages, just a, a page really, it's one of these men who were waiting at tables who is standing and preaching one of the great sermons of, of the book of the Acts. And we go over a, another page and we discover that it's now Philip who's down in Samaria and he's preaching the gospel there. And, uh, and then we discover that it's Philip who is sent and he is sitting in the chariot with the Ethiopian eunuch preaching unto him, Jesus. What's happening? Well, I think a wonderful thing is happening. We're seeing the work of, of God. And it's not just spreading geographically. Not just moving on geographically. It's beginning to move on generationally as well. Now, I don't know. It's very, very difficult for us to be uh, to make any sort of uh, definite assertions about the, the different respective ages of these people and, and whether Stephen was, uh, how his age would have compared to the age, let's say, of Peter and John. But, but that's really beside the point. What I want us to grasp is here that here's a work and it began with the apostles. So that's a tremendous thing, these apostles. Oh, what a wonderful thing to have the apostles amongst us. They, they walked with the Lord Jesus Christ. They talked with the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, it's almost as good as, as having the Savior himself here. We have the apostles here, and they knew him, and they moved with him, uh, and they're great men. And of course, the apostles did have a special responsibility and a special role, which is why uh, in, in chapter number eight, uh, when, when the work moves into a new area when the work moves into Samaria. That's why the apostles are brought down. And that is why the, uh, the, the people in Samaria don't receive the Holy Spirit until the apostles arrive. Not because this was going to be the normal way that things worked, but because we're moving to a new phase in the spread of the gospel. Maybe I should just emphasize that. There are, there are three occasions in the book of the Acts where you will read about speaking in tongues. Now, actually, uh, Acts chapter 8 is not one of those occasions. But in Acts chapter 8, there were some sort of visible manifestations that the Holy Spirit had been given, because we read in verse 18, when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles' hands. Now, that's actually, in, in, in a book that's full of conversion stories, it's striking that on only on three occasions do we have reference to speaking in tongues. And we have this occasion that seems to relate some sort of miraculous, some obvious manifestation of the giving of the Holy Spirit. And what were the other occasions? Well, there was, there was Acts 2. There was Pentecost. We have here Acts chapter 8. We get over to Acts chapter 10, and it's the conversion of Cornelius and his house. And Acts chapter 19, you'll remember there were those men who had been baptized with John's baptism, and they're rebaptized, and they received the Holy Spirit. Now, each of those occasions is something new happening for the first time. I mean, Acts chapter 2, the birthday of the church, it happened once, never happened again. Here in Acts chapter 8, we have a, a new frontier being breached. We're moving to Samaria. People are going to wonder, is this right? I, I mean, Samaritans, they're very dodgy sort of people. They have a very defective sort of belief. They, they worship in Mount uh, Gerizim. We have no dealings with the Samaritans. Are, are we sure that this is right? Are we sure that this is real? Uh, and so the apostles come and Peter was given the keys of the kingdom and, and Peter's there. And the Holy Spirit is given. It's very obvious these Samaritans have now been genuinely saved. We come over to chapter 10 and it's Cornelius. Oh, even, even a bit worse. I mean, at least the Samaritans were kind of half Jews. Not very good Jews, but they kind of had a Jewish heritage. But now we're talking about a Roman of all people. And he's getting saved. Could the, yes, 
that could be right. And that's very, a very important thing uh, when, when for the, the, the church in Jerusalem, when they hear that the Gentiles receive the Holy Ghost and evidence is needed. And so they speak in tongues. Over in Acts chapter 19, again, and by the way, there'll never be, the first Gentile will never be added to the church again. That's been done. It can't be done again for the first time. And over in Acts chapter 19, there's something else, just a little, a little dispensational loose end that needs to be tightened up. And can we be sure that these people have moved on to new ground? We need a visible manifestation. And, and these are the reasons why. These are the reasons why these manifestations are given. That's why it's important that the apostles are involved in Acts chapter 8, not as uh, evangelists so much, not in the spreading of the gospel, but in the verification of the reality of what had happened. But we're beginning to see, I say again, not just a geographical development, we're beginning to see a generational development. And I'm glad. Not just that the, the geographical development of Christianity carries on right down to the present day. But I'm glad as well that from generation to generation the torch has been passed on. And uh, people must have said, oh, I don't know how we'll manage when the apostles are. I don't know how we'll manage when, when Peter is taken from us. How are we, how's the work ever going to go on? How's the work ever going to survive? Peter is long gone. Oh, we have, we have his teaching in the word of God. But Peter is gone. And the other apostles are gone. John is gone. But the work carries on. And you know, there are great men of a previous generation, men that I remember, but, but some of you would. And we wondered how we could ever carry on without them. They're gone. And the work carries on. Speaking to someone recently uh, about a brother uh, uh, who's, who's getting a little bit older and, uh, and we were just observing that, that he won't be able to go on forever. And the brother I was talking to said, oh, I, you know, I, I'd say we'll not be able to have conferences the way we do anymore when that happens. We don't need to worry about it. God has kept this work going for over two millennia. <laughs> 2,000 years, generation has succeeded generation, and uh, God is still able to keep the work going. But mind you, we do have a responsibility to make sure that that happens as smoothly as it can. And I think it's tremendous here to see the apostles. You see, <laughs> some brethren want to do it all. And, uh, and if, they, they were the, if, they, if the apostles had been like them, they would have said, no, we'll, we'll just add that to our list of responsibilities. We've already got far too much to do, but we'll just add that on because, because we, don't want to, we don't want to cede control. We don't want to pass any responsibility on. We don't want to delegate it all. The apostles say, no, no. We need to delegate because we've got too, uh, too much to do. And there are things that, oh, it's all important. You'll notice that it was very important that spiritually qualified men were selected. It couldn't just be anybody. And when they were selected, it wasn't on the basis of their skill in accountancy or their intellect or anything like that. He says, men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom. It was all important. But they didn't want to do it all. And they knew they couldn't do it all. And so they say, here's, here's a task. And we can find people who are able to do that. You know, that was a really good thing because, well, we know that two of these men in very short space of time had, had, had developed further and their ability had grown. And, and the Stephen who was waiting at tables here is now, is now standing, I say again, giving one of the great sermons of a book that's full of great sermons. And Philip, the only man that your Bible will call an evangelist, Philip has gone to Samaria to preach the message of the gospel. And these men who are given response, spiritual men, men with a good testimony, men full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom, they're given responsibility. What happens? They grow. They advance. And they develop. And God is fitting them for greater service. And we have here a lovely model for something that we don't always get right. Just the, the transfer, the propagation of a work from one generation 
to another. And so the personnel, the personnel that are common is an important uh, connection. Now, there is an important matter that I maybe should mention here. And I'll just take a minute or two to mention it. <clears throat> it's a little bit tangential to, to the main thrust of where I want to go, but it's important. And I think it would be, it would be a pity to, to look at Acts chapter six and, uh, and maybe not just to say a couple of things about the subject of, of deacons. Deacons is, a, deacons is one of those subjects that can get you into trouble uh, very easily. Uh, <coughs> you know, you could ask three people what they think about deacons and you could get four different ideas. And there's, there's a couple of reasons for that. The first is that the Bible says very little about deacons. The second is that tradition says an awful lot about deacons. And so oftentimes when we're trying to understand what the Bible has to say about the idea of deacons and of deacon work, we're, we're sort of trying to navigate our way through what centuries of, of human tradition have added to the Bible. The reason I mention it here is that this is one of the passages that's often referred to when deacons come up. In fact, just in the notes of my Bible here, just of the, the, the head notes, it says seven deacons chosen. So if I were to take those notes just at face value, it would suggest that, that this is really important. And a lot of people will say, when we're thinking about deacons, we're thinking about men who do practical work, men who look after finances as, as we have here, men who look after the money, men who look after the painting of the hall or whatever it might be, and that's the work. Well, the difficulty with that, there are a couple of difficulties with that. The first difficulty is this, that uh, these men are never spoken of as deacons. The second difficulty is that there's no indication here. Remember, we, we've seen on previous occasions that the book of Acts is a, is a transitional book. And there's no indication here. We're still dealing here with, with apostles. There's no indication necessarily here that what is what is happening here is is normative for assemblies more widely. But perhaps the biggest, the most important thing to notice is this: is that while we don't have the use of the noun deacon in, in this passage, we have two references to to the, the, the verb for deacon service. And the first of those, at least two references, I should say, the first of those is in verse two. It is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables, serve as deacons at table. People say, well, there you go. That's deacon service, serving at tables. It's material. But then in verse four, the apostles say, we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry, to the same word, the deacon service of the word. So in actual fact, we have two types of deacon service. One of it is practical, the other is spiritual. One relates to finance, the other relates to the word of God. And, and without spending more time to develop it further, because it's an interesting subject that, that we could develop further, I just want to just, I suppose, if you're trying to, if you're, if you're looking at getting to grips with the scriptural teaching about deacons, be careful about how you use this passage. And just be aware that the word for, for deacon just means the word serve, just as the word for serve. And the sort of service that is involved seems to me to be very broad indeed. I don't think you can exclude the practical from it. But I certainly don't think we have any basis to limit it just to practical service. And uh, if you do want to look more at that, you'll, you'll forgive me just giving a tiny little plug. I wrote an article in the Truth and Tidings that comments on this passage and some others. Um, I suspect it's the sort of article that has dissatisfied most people, uh, but that's the nature of the subject. As I say, that's a little bit of a parenthesis, but be a pity not to, to note it as we're here in chapter six. There's another uh, continuity that runs through this section. So, so we've talked about the continuity of persecution and the way that God uses persecution for the, the blessing of uh, the, the, for the spread of the gospel and for the blessing of sinners. We've talked about the continuity of, of personnel. 
And we've seen how that God is able to raise up men and he's able to develop men so that the work goes on and so the work continues. Another important continuity that I do just want us to notice is the question really of what the work is going to look like. What, what, what is Christianity going to look like? And uh, allied to that is, is another important feature. Again, not something that we're seeing for the first time. Because you'll remember that as we were thinking about the, uh, the growing opposition of the Jews to the gospel, we have the very sad account of Ananias and, and Sapphira. And we discovered this, that when God works, when God blesses his people, and when God blesses the gospel, Satan does not only attack by external means, but he can attack by internal means as well. And uh, God moves in very sudden, sudden and solemn judgment to deal with the internal problem that arose in the case of Ananias and Sapphira. Now we have another internal problem. God is blessing. The work is going on. The work is prospering. The, the opposition on the outside, again, is beginning to build. But, but, but Satan's not just going to attack on a single front. And we read these solemn words at the beginning of chapter 6. In those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplied, very good, excellent, we love to see it. There arose a murmur of the Grecians against the Hebrews. Now we're dealing here, now you'll appreciate, this is not the, this is not the big tension between Jew and Gentile that is going to that is going to rumble on and that Paul will have to deal with so extensively in the epistle. We're still dealing with Jerusalem. We're, we're still dealing here with people from a Jewish background. But from that Jewish background, we have those Judean Jews and we have the, the Hellenistic Jews, the Jews, the Greek-speaking Jews who, who had come from uh, other parts of, of the Roman Empire. And although they were all Jews, or at least all from a Jewish background, and although they had now been saved, there was just a, there was just a distinction, just a difference. And it lingered on. And because historically, and because, we're not right to say ethnically, but because in terms of where they were culturally, that's the better word. Because historically and culturally, there was a difference. That just becomes a point of friction. It becomes a fault line. It becomes a point of disunity. And the great danger is this. Now what external opposition had not done. What external opposition would not do? Internal division might achieve. And it was only a little thing. I, I did remember everyone had uh, had their every had everything in common at this stage. This is one of the things that this is not kind of a normal pattern for for church life. There was that. That they had everything in common, they shared everything together, and so there had to be a, a daily ministration. And people started to say it's not fair. They're getting more than we are. We're being neglected. We're being discriminated against. And, uh, and friction begins to enter in. And it's not about, it's not about an issue of doctrine. It's just about a practical, everyday, material thing. And yet, this has the potential to hinder the work of God. The potential to distract the apostle. 
because that's what uh, the 12 say. It is not the reason that we should leave the word of God and serve him. It would distract them. It would distract their focus from where it ought to be. And it would create division among the people of God. You see, Satan does sometimes work by external opposition. As I say already, there are believers who know far more about it than we do. Likely, we are, we're going to learn more about it, I suspect. The difficulty of external opposition and actual persecution. But I sometimes wonder whether Satan would really feel that he needs to bother with external persecution. When he can just work so well. And we can just be so helpful to him. When it comes to division. Internally. Over tiny things. Not over important consequential issues of doctrine. But just over small, petty, practical things. Sometimes exacerbating those, those pre-existing divisions of, of culture and background and, and identity that might already be there. And this is a dangerous moment for the church in Jerusalem. And we should be very thankful, not just that the twelve had the wisdom to handle it as they did. But these, these seven men, by the way, we might think that Oh, well, Stephen, he went on to do something important. And Philip, he went on to do something important. And maybe I've even spoken about them like that already today. We are greatly in the debt of these seven men. Because if this problem had not been resolved, then the repercussions for, for Christianity would have been very, very serious. And with spiritual wisdom, spiritual men, guided by the Holy Ghost, are able to address the problem. But really, it should never have arisen in the first place. And so we have a problem of, of division. And one of, the, one of the tremendously important things is this. The apostles, they just, they just keep the focus right. They say, it is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. And you'll notice that as a result of the wise way in which they acted, they said in verse 4, we want to give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And because of the wise way in which they acted, verse 7, the word of God increased and the number of disciples multiplied in Jerusalem greatly. One of the things that was very important here in Jerusalem is that the practical and the material, and will you allow me to say the social aspect of the work was kept in its proper place. And what the apostles understood and what the apostles demonstrated when we get to verse 7 is the thing that's really important. The thing that is our first priority is the preaching and the propagation of the word of God. And listen, brothers and sisters, that is still our number one priority. That is what we are here to do. Now we should, as we have opportunity, do good to all men. And especially to the household of faith. And we should be good neighbors. But I am concerned that in parts there seems to be a kind of a, an embarrassment about the preaching of the gospel. And it has to be almost concealed with coffee morning. And neighborhood lunches. And, and I'm not saying that these things do not have a place but we just need to be very careful. Because it is so easy for the focus to shift from where the focus ought to be. So easy for us to begin to think that what really matters is the serving at tables. What really matters is the practical ministration to the needs of the people. And the apostles here show us a more excellent way. The apostles here remind us what we're really here to do. We're here to preach the word of God. We're here to make known the message of the gospel. And as the word of God increases, in verse 7, the number of disciples multiplies in Jerusalem greatly. And so there's the division text. 
and priorities. What sort of a what sort of a movement is Christianity going to be? Is it going to be a social movement? No. It's going to be a movement. Spiritual men preach the word of God. See souls saved. See disciples multiply. Not just souls saved, but disciples multiply. Those who follow to learn. Those who are obedient to the word of God. And they were multiplying. A great number of, a great company of the priests were obedient to the faith. Much more could be said about that. Just very briefly, because I need to close. There was another, there was another danger. And it wasn't now the, the danger of division. It was the danger of imitation. Simon the Sorcerer. One of the, one of the things that could hold you up in the Bible reading. Was he saved or not? <clears throat> I, I struggle. I know it says that he believed. And he was baptized. Yeah. <clears throat> but look at the language that, uh, that Peter uses about. Thy money perish with them. I mean that's very strong language. I noticed one of the commentators rendered it. To hell with you and your money. Now that's not language we would use. But that's very very close. To the sense of what Peter says here. Peter says. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter. Thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent therefore of this thy wickedness. And pray God. And put all that together. And I just find it difficult. To see that we're dealing here with a man. Who is genuinely saved. He's in the gall of bitterness. And he's in the bond of iniquity. But the thing is this. He had professed to be saved. He believed. Philip. Philip was. Philip was happy that he was saved. Because he was baptized. Not only that. But we're told that he continued. With Philip. And uh, this is great. Here's a man. He's believed. He's been baptized. He's continuing. But his sense of priority. His sense of what mattered. Perhaps revealed that he never, he never really been saved at all. And there have been people who have made the mistake. Of thinking that Christianity is all about serving tables. The mistake of chapter 6. But I'm afraid this world is full with people who have made the mistake of thinking Christianity is, just like Simon did, thinking Christianity is all about the spectacular. He used to be great. I, he used to be a sorcerer. He had had some sort of demonic power. Uh, he bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that he himself was some great one. They said, this man is the great power of God. And he says, now I can, now I, what I used to do, I can move it on to the next level. And I can have great, I can just, if I could pay some money, I would have this, I would have this power that I could lay hands on people and there would be some sort of miraculous manifestation. And the sad reality is this, that Christendom, right down to the present day, is full of the descendants of Simon the Sorcerer. And they think Christianity is all about the spectacular. Christianity is all about the external. And their motives so often are like the motives that Simon had, that, 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 that Philip is able to identify so clearly. He offered them money. It's all about cash. And it's all about prosperity. And it's all about wealth. And there is a, a, a great insult to the name of Christ and to the gospel in those who distort Christianity. Not those who distort it to make it a social thing. That's, that's been disastrous for Christianity down through the years. But those who distort it to make it a spectacular thing. To make it a thing that's all about the visible and the external and the spectacular. And the problem here was this. The man was never really saved. Oh, he, he looked good. 
he, he had come some of the way. But what, what Peter says could be said to many who, who profess to be Christians and yet who go in for this sort of thing. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter. And so this section presents to us just a number of the dangers that beset what I suppose we could still call that a fledgling Christianity. You say, how, how did the, uh, how did the apostles, how did the early believers, how did they manage to navigate these difficulties? How did they manage to make their way through these rocky waters and, 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 and keep their priorities right and keep things just level and keep the work going on and keep things progressing and spreading? We would need that secret as well because we cope with the same dangers. What was the secret? Well, it's just what it's been right the way through this book of the Acts. This is how God's spirit works through his people. And we've seen the emphasis on, 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 on being led, being guided by the Holy Spirit of God. One of the things that these, these chapters of the book of the Acts, as, as there are these, these sad things, these difficult days and these dark days, one of the things that they do is give me confidence. God, by the power of his Holy Spirit, is able to keep this thing going. It was established here in the book of the Acts. It grew here in the book of the Acts. It faced challenges and difficulties here in the book of the Acts. And right down to the present day. Still growing. And it's still going on. Thank God we still have the guidance of the same Holy Spirit. As we face external opposition, challenging and serious, but as we deal with what is perhaps more dangerous still, maybe problems of division, maybe problems <clears throat> of disguise, may God grant that we'll be able to keep our priorities clear and be faithful to him so that we can play our part just keeping the thing going and moving on and moving outwards and may God grant that in our day as well disciples will be multiplied and we rejoice to see the hand of God at work amongst us. Trust the God will bless his word with close the word. Our Father we bow in thy presence we give thee thanks again for thy word and thank thee for the record of uh, the book of the Acts, and for the faithfulness of these men, men and women like us, and yet used by thee in an extraordinary way, in extraordinary days. We thank thee, our Father, that we too can play our part, that the work is still going on, and we pray, our Father, for help to be faithful to thee as they were. We thank thee, our Father, that we've read of blessing in spite of persecution, read of blessing in spite of difficulty. We would long to know something similar in our own day. We commit ourselves to thee. We pray that thou will bless thy word to us. Encourage our hearts. And be with us now as we part. Watch over us, we ask. In the precious and worthy name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.